What is your next book going to be about and why are you writing it? Well, my career has been going back 65 years. I've been doing a lot of things from policy to lecturing, of course, research and so forth. So I've learned some things over those 65 years. And uh, there's some key things that I want to include that describes for me better this whole idea of how food is related to nutrition. Are the conclusions you came to when you published your book, The China Study, still the same today? Has there been research since then that has changed your mind? Well, the first version was uh, published in 2005. And then it was the second expanded, so-called expanded one, in 2016. They're virtually the same, except there was another new chapter in there, and my son, Tom, uh, also added something, too. Uh, but it's, it's basically the same, yeah. If nutrition is the most effective medicine, why isn't it taught in medical schools? Well, that's the topic of my lecture today. Uh, basically, uh, medicine is what I call a reductionist approach to health. Looking at details, individual diseases, individual things in food and so forth. Uh, instead, nutrition is a so-called holist disease. That's W-H-O-L-I-S-T, uh, where, where we're looking at things much more comprehensively and things working together. It's a, it's a fantastic thing. That concept of holism does not lend itself to commercial exploitation. That's the problem. So nutrition is not in medical schools. In fact, there's not even a single medical specialty of 130 medical specialties that's actually dedicated to nutrition. So nutrition is excluded from the conversation. Are there studies that prove that animal protein is a cause of cancer? Well, that was the centerpiece of my research early in my career. I was on the opposite side of the fence, basically thinking that animal protein is the best of the best nutrients. And what I learned early on was that, uh, experimentally at least, uh, animal protein actually increases cancer development rather dramatically. Later on in the career, there were lots of studies came out, usually under different names, showing that if you correlate food consumption with disease outcome like cancer, heart disease, and so forth, it's a straight line relationship. So yes, from multiple perspectives, essentially, animal protein is a problem, not specifically because of the protein itself, but because the effect it has on the rest of the diet. In chapter three of the China study, <coughs> what did you mean by turning off cancer? Well, we learned experimentally that uh, cancer starts with a genetic modification. We call it a mutation. Many people think that's the cause, end of story. But mutations don't reverse, we know that biologically. And what we found was that starting out with a mutation, and then change the level of animal protein, we could turn on cancer growth or turn it off. Very dramatic. Did the money you got to do your studies come from industry or government? And does that matter? It matters greatly. But uh, we were funded generously for many years. 100% of the money I got was from the American taxpayer, for whom I'm very grateful. Nothing came from industry. From your early studies in the Philippines and on animals, did you learn what the mechanism was for high protein food increased cancer? We set out on that course trying to understand what was the, the mechanism. That went on for about at least 10 to 12 years with a number of different graduate students, for example, each one of them working on a possible mechanism. And I learned that there's no such thing as the mechanism. That's the ground for development of drugs. What we found was instead of one operating, all host of them all work together in really a grand way. It was really impressive. In chapter 13 of the China study, what did you mean by science, the dark side? Well, I've of course been in, in, in science for all these years, uh, very much from the policy level to the laboratory and so forth, and a lot of so-called expert panels as well. That perspective, from bottom to the top, essentially, I learned something that I didn't know in the beginning. Science is largely controlled by industry. 
but not quite so simply as I just said it. In reality, we have national guidelines, we have national advisories put up by the government. But in those efforts to make those kind of statements for the public, industry is behind the game. Partly because we have the best government that money can buy. And Citizens United, I should add this here, Citizens United decision of the Supreme Court enabled the private sector to pour into money into political races. That was a disaster. And that's really what I'm talking about. So it's a, it's, yes, it comes out under the government label, this kind of information, but in reality, the corporate sector is very much behind it. Science, unfortunately, uh, good people, wonderful people, they're my colleagues. We can't necessarily do all the research we'd like to do, get the funding for it if we're going to do something that's in conflict with what I just said, or in conflict of their interest. 